We're talking today, it's Reformation Sunday, uh, and this all kicked off. The reason we celebrate this is because of Martin Luther in 1517. It would have been on Halloween, uh, October 31st, 1517, either mailing out or some reports have tacking the 95 theses to the door of the Wittenberg Church. He didn't mail them to the church. He mailed them out to other people. But uh, interestingly enough, we've talked about Luther for the past two weeks. I'm only going to mention him at the beginning here, and then we're going to talk about John Calvin a little bit or quote him at least a couple times. But when you look at it, there was, there was an awful lot of different uh, ideas and uh, reforming thoughts floating around at this time. You can pick out uh, anybody from a guy named Erasmus to uh, Ulrich Zwingli, Martin Luther, John Calvin, uh, you can look at some who would who would fit in the same category that stayed Catholic, Ignatius Loyola, um, Savonarola, all these different names that come up at this time. These three guys that I have on the on the screen represent kind of the first. The, the Martin Luther and Zwingli represent kind of two of the early first generation reformers. John Calvin is kind of the second generation. By the third generation, uh, you've got a whole different thing going on. But uh, it it's. It's this wave that's going across Europe in the 1500s especially. And as you look at these three guys, I picked them out specifically because sometimes people see all the division that happened um, in, through the Reformation and they wonder, did any of these guys agree on anything at all? Surprisingly though, uh, these three guys particularly are representative of three people who could agree on an awful lot. Sometimes John Calvin gets pegged as, oh, he's a predestination guy. Well, so was Luther, frankly. They could agree on those kinds of things. There were, there were a lot of things they agreed on. The Lord's Supper was typically the thing that kind of divided a lot of these people. How do we understand that, just as an example? So Martin Luther was very Roman Catholic in his understanding, just kind of a step removed from that with this consubstantiation idea. Uh, John Calvin was a little bit further over, both kind of sacramental, we'd call them. Uh, John Calvin kind of that were lifted up uh, with the spirit into the presence, if you will. And then Ulrich Zwingli, uh, who was a Swiss reformer, would have been uh, more in what we call an ordinance category. It's a symbolic thing, and that's all it is. They had differences for sure, but they agreed on an awful lot. And some of what comes out of the Reformation, kind of the, the five solas are what we come back to and point as sort of main themes that were picked out during the Reformation. They might not have used the specific terminology, uh, but these are the themes that rose out. So we've talked about for God's glory alone, or at least it was in the background of the first sermon. Last week we talked about Scripture alone. And we should understand when they said Scripture alone, they didn't mean you couldn't appeal to other church authorities of the past. They certainly did. They, a lot of them looked at St. Augustine for his writings, but they looked through church leaders and theologians throughout the centuries. What they said was, if what those theologians said doesn't line up with Scripture, Scripture is our authority, not that thinker. That's the difference. Scripture is the bottom line. It's the authority. It's the rule. Canon is where we get that word. It's a rule. Today, Christ alone is what we're on. That's what sola is alone. Uh, and then we'll look at faith and grace. And we're going to look at Romans 3. If you're following along, I encourage you to do that in just a moment. And we'll start at verse 21. But I was telling you that the, you have sort of the first generation of reformers. Uh, we can see that in two of the guys that were shown there, Zwingli and, and Luther. Luther really, he did have a, a breadth of themes that he focused on, but they were still pretty narrow. Uh, he was very concerned with salvation and what does salvation look like and, and authority uh, issues within the church um, and, and our authority coming from Scripture. But it's the second wave of people, and especially someone like John Calvin, uh, who's really just being born when Luther is starting to teach. They were contemporaries, but, but they were staggered uh, on their lifespan. He's, a, he's one of those who they, he could move us from simply justification to what now, the life of sanctification. And I hope you hear this morning as we look at Romans 3, we'll, we'll use a couple thoughts that Calvin brought to this. Um, I hope you can hear, yes, we're going to talk about justification, that's been our point, or righteousness, we're using them interchangeably, that we can be set right with God. But I hope you can hear that there's something that needs to come after that. We're not going to follow that fully, but, but John Calvin pushes us in that direction. I think it's good. So Romans 3, 21 through 26, I'm going to read it. That's not going to come up on the screen uh, if you're following along, and then we'll pick out a couple verses as we go. Paul writes, But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. 
This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. If you look at verse 23, to begin with, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, Paul takes, uh, it fits with his, what he's saying here, but it really is almost an aside to point back to all that he's already said in Romans 1 through 3.20. He's talked about the life before righteousness, what was lost, where, we, where you are without Christ and his atoning sacrifice. When you get to, and we'll come back to that verse in a little bit, when you get to verse 25, especially the second half, we have an interesting thing that Paul brings in here. Uh, he says, uh, mine has a separate sentence starting halfway through verse 25, yours may not. He said, he did this to demonstrate his righteousness, because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. There is a sense in which Paul is pointing to the fact that the old sacrificial system of the Old Testament, it had a, it had a specific function, but as the author of Hebrews tells us, the bull of blood, and go, or blood of bulls and goats had no power to forgive sin. God gave the sacrificial system as a gift, but in many ways it's marking time, and in many ways it's, it's showing what the value of that sacrifice in Jesus Christ is going to be. It's, it's people are involved in this. They have, to, they have to do the sacrificing or have somebody do it on their behalf. And it explains through the generations what's going to happen to Jesus Christ. It shows the value of the sacrifice that is coming. And in many ways it's, it's just holding time until God deals with the fullness of sin. To enlighten us further, uh, in the book of Second Peter, Peter writes, um, he says, But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. So through the sacrificial system, God is saying, okay, we can... The law tells you what's right. You've all fallen short, Romans 3.23 tells us. Everybody has. Everybody has fallen short. We know it's right. We just can't meet up with it. The sacrificial system gives a temporary renewal to put you back in right standing, essentially, until God fully and completely deals with the problem. And then we might wonder, okay, then when Jesus Christ comes, why aren't we just magically whisked away? And it's, it's this whole mystery about how God's kingdom is going to roll in. That's, in fact, what the, the Jewish expectation was throughout the Old Testament, that when the Messiah came, the kingdom of God would start, and the old kingdom would fall away. It'd be kind of like a hard barrier. You go from one to the other, but instead God seems to mesh the two together and grow the kingdom in the midst, the wheat in the midst of the weeds. And Second Peter kind of alludes to the fact that God wants everybody to come to repentance. God wants everybody to realize the value of what was there in the sacrificial system that's now realized in Jesus Christ, that's now offered to everyone for their salvation. We have to recognize, though, you're called out of sin to righteousness. That's what Paul's telling us. We're called out of sin to righteousness. To put it a different way, you can be self-righteous, but you can't make yourself righteous. Do you hear that? You can be self-righteous, but you can't make yourself righteous. You can be prideful. You can try and do it yourself, which is actually the way of pride, but there is no possible way that you can make yourself righteous. Only Jesus Christ can do that. And we understand the value of that because you can see this long-awaited period through the sacrificial system when finally the one true sacrifice comes for you and me. And the door is not closed immediately, but opened so that we would come in to the fold.
When we look at the issue of righteousness, then, you're called out of sin to righteousness. We defined righteousness as basically being set right with the law, as if we never broke it in the first place, and being entitled to the blessings that come from God. So we're put right and given access to those blessings. What Paul is addressing when he's talking about us being moved into that category, being given that possibility of becoming righteous through Jesus Christ to be justified, the key problem is that we have wrong relationship with God. We don't want to think that sometimes, but by default, we're out of communion with God. That's what sin does. It doesn't put us in right relationship. By default, we want to think that we're spiritual or good or whatever, and we have a lot of good qualities about us, but we're not good enough. We have wrong relationship to begin with. And so the key question becomes, how do I get righteous? How do I become righteous? How do I get this right relationship, again, that's been broken? Well, we need to recognize a couple things, and then we'll get into some systematic theology, and I know you're just excited for that this morning, so we'll get there. But when God creates, and he gives the gift of life to Adam and Eve, we have to recognize that wasn't a right. That was a gift. God has given all of us the gift, not the right, to life. It was a gift given by God at God's pleasure because God wanted to do it, not because we did anything. God also gives the gift of his presence to Adam and Eve from the very beginning. Not a right, a gift given. And that's broken by sin from the human side. God wants them to choose and continue to choose to love. But they choose themselves. They become self-righteous, if you will. What's interesting is in their children, Cain and Abel, you see that already God has set up the sacrificial system, a God-given system to repair that relationship. And you can see when Cain kills Abel because he brought the wrong sacrifice, that Cain teaches us that there are no shortcuts to this righteousness. God's given us the gift. God's given us the way to do it. You can't shortcut your way to it. And in fact, what he shows us is when you try and take shortcuts you just tend to get further into the problem, not closer to the solution. Now, let's look at Romans 3.25. So we understand that we're far, there's the key problem, and we need to be made right. We're called from righteousness, or called out of sin to righteousness. If you look at verse 25, we'll look at the first half of it now, of chapter 3 of Romans. It says, God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement, through the shedding of his blood. And you can see on the screen, now you've got three different translations there with three different words in the same place. And I can guarantee we're using at least those three in the, the sanctuary right now, or at least two of those three right now. So mine reads that he's a sacrifice of atonement. If you're reading from the RSV or the King James, or, or not King James, the RSV and a couple others, you have that he is an expiation by his blood. And if you're reading the New American Standard, uh, God displayed publicly as a propitiation. How about that? Three different words used in the same place for the same Greek word that's there. If you look at the word propitiation, we'll start there. It could be that. That's one of the options. In its simplest term, and this is why a lot of people don't like this term, uh, to propitiate something means to appease or pacify the anger, especially of a god. People look at that and they say, I don't like that. That doesn't seem like it makes sense with God. And you'd be right. It doesn't make sense with God. That's not typically how you see it in Scripture when a word like that is used. It's not to just appease the anger of God. It's, it's much more like justification. It's to make a thing or person consistent with God's character, with God's blessings, with God's rule. That's what it's doing. It's, it's the appropriate putting it back and right with God, much more closer to justification. When you see the word expiation, then it's to cleanse, purge, or remove something. And so if you want to put those two concepts of propitiation and expiation together, which is perfectly viable to do, uh, here's a simple household analogy. Uh, expiation is like washing your laundry. Propitiation is like folding, pressing it, and putting it back. So that's what's going on. Expiation cleaning, propitiation, putting it back. A lot of times, though, we, we live in a culture where people want to uh, go for the propitiation, be put back in right relationship without the expiation. So, God, you're going to love me the way I come and the way that I am, 
take me as I am, but we don't actually ask for forgiveness or cleansing. We just want to be put back to right with God. You actually need both, as it turns out. Atonement is what's used in the NIV. I'm not actually suggesting that one's right, but I, I do think that it, it brings in more of the propitiation side than the expiation. It really just means at one minute to reconcile or put back together that which is broken. Um, and there's a lot of scholarly divide on which one of these should be the exact right thing, but if you put them all together, you get the basic idea. Um, they're just talking about which specific thrust Paul is giving in the technical word. Atonement, I think, is close enough for our, our use today to get the idea. Um, it tends towards propitiation, but it could include expiation. Let's just point out what's behind the word that's there, though, because we heard from Leviticus 16 this morning. Behind the word is the idea of the atonement cover or mercy seat uh, that was over the Ark of the Covenant. And we heard this morning from Leviticus 16 that on the day of the atonement, once a year, uh, Aaron or the high priest was supposed to go in and supposed to offer sacrifice for the sins of his own family. And then he's supposed to take in the two goats, slaughter the one goat, and, and we'll keep it simplified version from what we heard, and put the blood of that goat on the atonement cover that washes down over the atonement cover. What's inside the Ark of the Covenant are the Ten Commandments, the law that's broken by our sin. And that covers over the brokenness of the law. It puts back to right by taking the lifeblood of the Lamb. It, it atones for the penalty, which would be death, essentially, for breaking the law, ultimately. The other uh, goat that's used then becomes literally, this is where we get the term scapegoat, where then Aaron puts his hand on the head, and the sins of the people are confessed, and that goat is sent out to take away the sins of the people. Jesus, by the way, functions as both of these for us in his sacrifice. Now we have a problem that enters into this of, of why we would need this in the first place. Not simply of, of our sin, but of God's reaction to our sin. And that is the problem of wrath. We don't like to think of God as wrathful, I think. We like to think of God as love, and that's about it. But God has wrath. God has wrath towards sin. The theologian, the late John Stott, says that sin arouses God's wrath and anger. Towards sin is what it's aimed at. And we sometimes just pass over that quickly. Uh, let's think about it in terms of our human relationships. If you run into somebody that's a real button pusher, you ever have those around? Maybe you are one if you don't have one around. Uh, they really just mess with you. Now, sometimes it's all in good fun, right? But sometimes people push it, take it way too far. Sometimes that can annoy us. I don't know if you're, if you're that way, but, but if you get people that just push your buttons the wrong way and just keep pushing it, keep pushing it, keep pushing it, it pushes you pretty far sometimes. For some people to a breaking point, I just can't stand this anymore. It arouses anger, right? Well, then you can look uh, historically, and you can even look in your own life. There would be uh, civilizations that would conquer other civilizations historically, and they wouldn't just conquer them, but what would they do? Salt the earth so you can never plant anything again. They're not just conquering. They're mean about it, right? They're vindictive. People in uh, times past or in agricultural settings, barn burners, right? You never want to be a barn burner because you're burning down somebody's livelihood, or an arsonist in our time and place, or people who slander and gossip, or just mean, or cruel, or worse. That arouses anger when injustice happens, doesn't it? We understand that. That's what's happening with sin. It arouses God's anger. Furthermore, we can't buy off God or bribe God. That's why the idea of propitiation as a, a payoff doesn't work out. We don't have a volatile God who's unpredictable. God's, in fact, very predictable. He, he's told us who he is and what to expect when we turn to him. We can't bribe God or buy away his anger towards sin. But again, we might say, and our, our, we do often experience this in our culture, but God is love, right? So isn't God going to overlook any character flaws or sins or mistakes I've made, if there are any, isn't God just going to look over those things, right? Problem solved. He'll just take me. But that's not what we're told. And, and here's, it, it gets worse, and there's good news and bad news. P.P. P. Waldenstrom, one of our uh, early, Christian, or early covenant thinkers, he says, God must hate sin. You ever think about that? God must hate sin, he says, as long as he is a holy God. Wrath over sin is, so to speak, the reverse of love 
for righteousness. If God loves righteousness, he's got to hate and have wrath towards sin. So there's good news there. God hates sin, which means God hates injustice. I'm going to guess that we do too. We hate injustice. We should hate sin just as much. And that can never change in God's character. But God hates sin. The bad news is that if we don't take care of it, that get back to that term expiation, if we don't cleanse, if we aren't forgiven for that sin, then God's wrath for sin, if it's still on you, is going to be aimed at where the sin is. So it's going to be aimed at the person who holds the sin, not simply the sin itself. And you can see then what God is doing when he justifies is illustrated in something like the parable of the unmerciful servant that we see in Matthew 18. We just need to hear the first part to get the, the forgiveness piece or the atonement piece where the, the man who is deeply in debt couldn't repay it back even if he lived a thousand years. That's the point. To the, the, the master who's wealthy, he's forgiven of the debt. The same thing is operative then in us when it comes to sin. It's just taken off our back just like his debt is taken away. And scripture uses all kinds of examples like that for atonement, for what's being done to make sure that the crosshairs are taken off of our back and squarely just towards sin and being justified. It uses things like liberation or freedom as a slave being manumitted or freed in the ancient world. It uses holiness or cleansing ideas, that expiation concept. It uses changing loyalties uh, from one king to another, or that sort of thing. Metamorphosis, becoming more like Christ uh, or transforming. Uh, relational ideas, economic ideas, the, the debt being taken care of. Victory images, healing, sin is a disease and we're cured of it or healed from it. Um, and legal examples, like we hear with just the term justification. Don't get locked into one. Scripture uses all kinds of them to help us understand the fullness of what's going on. But importantly, we have to recognize what Paul keeps pointing out is that we can't do it ourselves. It's done for us. We have to accept that. So John Calvin says, The efficient cause of our eternal salvation, the Scripture uniformly proclaims to be the mercy and free love of the Heavenly Father, towards us. Thanks be to God. The material cause to be Christ with the obedience by which he purchased righteousness for us. And what can be the formal or instrumental cause be but faith. We need to choose it. We need to go towards it, whatever you want to say. Let's go back, uh, because I want to do a couple thoughts with John Calvin here and then draw to a close. Let's go back to Romans 3.23. Very famous, many of you probably have it memorized, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, or fall short of the glory of God. The actual specific uh, Greek term that's used for uh, sin there, there are lots of terms used for sin. This specific one, hamartano, is to miss the mark, like an arrow being pulled back and shot, and it missed the target. That's, what's, that's the image that's involved in the word. So the intent matters, right? We, could, we can seek all we want, to be completely righteous on our own, but at some point we're going to miss the target. We're not going to hit it. That's what Paul's saying. That's why it, it empowers his words uh, on what's happened here. You can have great uh, intent to do right. You just can't do it yourself. But the effect of missing the mark and living into missing the mark over and over is, is that through that brokenness, we're going to miss out on God's promise and and what God has for us. And John Calvin says three things are lost when we miss the mark like this. When when we're just, even if the greatest intent, when we're not hitting it. He says we come short of glorifying God. First and foremost, our best work in this life could be wonderful, but it's just going to be the best work we can do in this life. Here today, gone tomorrow. And that's the end of it. He says, we'll come short of glorifying before God. That is to say, we're going to be really content with human applause, and God's applause is not going to matter to us. We can get more, uh, we can post more on social media, we can do more, we can get more awards, money, whatever we want. We can do tremendous in school, in work, wherever we are. But if it's absent of God, and if we've continued to miss the mark, if we're trying it on ourselves, we're, we're just going for human applause, not God's. And thirdly, he says, we, can, we will come short of being glorified by 
God. No real transformation is going to occur in us to make us like Christ and bring us to glory, is what he says. Bring us to what really matters more than anything. We might challenge ourselves in life. That might be the case. In fact, we have a fairly uh, 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 adrenaline-fueled society, I think, so we might go base jumping or we might travel the world. We might challenge ourselves to do a lot of things, right? But but we don't challenge ourselves to renovate our heart and allow God to do that for us. The result, John Calvin says, working from Paul's words here, he says we come short of justification in those cases. And ultimately, we come short of being accepted by God and thus uh, joining in God's glory. We're called out of sin to righteousness. That's what we learn here in Paul's words. What that really means is that we're called to glory, not just out of something, but we're called to be with God in God's presence. Starting now, that's what Calvin tells us. He says that the glory starts once we've chosen that, once we've walked into that. I have a friend uh, who is uh, now in his 80s. He's from halfway around the world. He, uh, he has grown kids, grandkids, um, and he's, he's got a really interesting, remarkable life. Uh, for most of that, he wasn't a believer and became a believer in his 70s. And I didn't know him before that, um, but I, I, learned, I came to know him when he was in his 70s. And, and through his broken English, he, he just, his testimony is just marvelous. Uh, a daily testimony to God's goodness in his life. Walks everywhere with his Bible, reads it constantly wants to know because he looks back at his life and it's not that he's not proud of his children it's not that he's not proud of his marriage over all those years and work that he did but he considers an awful lot of that wasted time when he looks at what he has in Christ now still has good relationships with his family and and his kids but he's a testimony to freedom in Christ now and he recognizes what he's gained the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 1.18, he says, For the message of Christ is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. One of the deceitful things about sin is that it's deceivingly fun. It's deceivingly fun for people to participate in and get involved in until you finally realize at the end that it really wasn't worth it. The life of righteousness is astonishingly better. So we can be deceived into thinking that they're, all that life has to offer is, is anything without God or short of God or being a spiritual person or whatever. But until we've come in and been set right with God and begun living that life, that's when we realize that it's astonishingly better and more valuable. 2 Corinthians 2.15 says, For we are to God the pleasing aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. Uh, my friend has the aroma of Christ. To me, even, I smell it. You come around him and you're refreshed because of the work that God is doing in his life, and it starts to impact your own faith. You see, the smell of righteousness is stronger than the stink of sin. When we come to Jesus Christ, the smell of righteousness is stronger, even though it looks like the way before is just fine. Once we walk over the line, once we're made right with God, we realize the glory that we're walking into. It's astonishingly better. That's where value starts and real life begins. So we can be self-righteous. We can't make ourselves righteous. Only Jesus can do that. And so as we enter into prayer right now, I just want to call us to be people who smell like Christ and enter into that righteousness. Let's pray. Father, may we not be prideful and try and work our way to you. May we be humble, be your humble servants, and be those who who, uh, have that fragrant aroma to you, not playing the part of a believer, but really following. Not pretending to buy your love and affection, as we sometimes do in this life, to try and just please others so they would accept us, but to recognize that you accepted us while we were still sinners. That you said you loved us, 
and you offer us redemption in spite of our flaws. And so, God, would you enter, uh, accept us into your presence today and allow us to experience your glory. Father, we're thankful that we can be here today, and while we're sad and lament disunity that still persists within your church, we celebrate where it continues, where we can see your good work and your good news in the lives of those we worship with, in the lives of those in this community who worship and love you. And Father, we pray that we would continue as your people in this community in Lincoln to have the aroma of Christ, that others would sense your glory, that others would want to know what this righteousness looks like. May we be in your presence today and go forth with your presence. We pray this in your name. Amen.